ever get the feeling that reading a book is kind of like uh, watching a color show in your head? Hmm, interesting. You mean beyond the words on the page. Exactly. We're talking yeah. about words themselves sparking colors, like fireworks, right in your mind. I see. You're talking about synesthesia. That's the one. Today, we're taking a deep dive into this whole world where the senses get, well, a little mixed up. It really makes you wonder what we consider normal when it comes to our senses, doesn't it? Totally. We've got a mountain of research here. Everything from the basics to some pretty wild stuff about how this affects creativity, even how our brains are wired. Pretty amazing, actually. So, ready to jump into the deep end? Let's do it. All right. So, uh, synesthesia. Not about having superpowers, right? Right. Not extra senses, but more like experiencing our senses in a way that's blended together. For someone with synesthesia, just hearing a sound might make them taste something. Wow. Or maybe seeing a simple number always makes them picture a specific color. Wild. But it's always the same for them, right? Like, Tuesdays always say blue. Precisely. It's consistent. <laughs> Think of your favorite song always having the same vibrant music video playing in your mind. That's the kind of thing we're talking about. Wow, that's a really cool way to explain it. So what are some of the like most common ways this shows up? I bet there's a whole bunch. You're absolutely right. There are quite a few variations. A common one is graphene color synesthesia. Graphene, huh? Sounds complicated. Not really. It just means letters or numbers consistently trigger specific colors for someone. Like the letter A might always appear fiery red for them, while the number five is a calm, cool blue. Huh. So every time they sing an A, bam, red. Exactly. I can see how that would uh, make reading a totally different experience. You can say that again. What about music? Does that play into this whole synesthesia thing too? I've always been curious about that. Absolutely. It's called chromesthesia, and it's more common than people think. Mm -hmm. Imagine going to a concert, but instead of just hearing the music, yeah. you also see a symphony of colors swirling around, perfectly matching every note and beat. Wow, talk about a light show. Each note would have its own color, making it a visual and auditory feast for the senses. Now that's what I call a multi-sensory experience. Okay, but what about, and this might sound strange, but what about those cases where people taste words? How is that even possible? It does sound strange, but it's a real phenomenon. Lexical gustatory synesthesia. It shows just how deeply our senses can be connected. So how does it work? Well, someone with this type of synesthesia might taste something specific whenever they hear or see a certain word. Like the word sunshine could taste like, let's say, sweet lemonade, while Tuesday might have a distinct cinnamon flavor. Whoa, that's wild. Tuesday is cinnamon. My brain is having a hard time wrapping itself around that one. So mm. how does this even happen in the brain? Is it like some kind of magic trick? Well, not magic. But it's definitely a fascinating question. We don't have all the answers yet, but research points to it being a combination of things like inheriting certain genes, how your brain is wired, and even what happened when you were a kid. Okay, so let's break that down a bit. What about genes? What role do they play in this whole synesthesia thing? Well, we've noticed that synesthesia seems to run in families, which tells us genes are probably involved. So it's like inheriting your mom's eyes or your dad's, uh, I don't know, love for pickles. Sort of. It's not a single synesthesia gene, though. More like a bunch of genes working together, kind of like a team, that mm. make you more likely to have these sensory experiences mixed up. Interesting. So you inherit the possibility of these uh, sensory connections. You got it. But it's not just about the genes themselves. It's also about how they shape your brain's wiring. You know, how all those neurons connect and talk to each other. So our brains on synesthesia are wired differently. Tell me more. One theory, cross-activation, suggests that in people with synesthesia, there's just more communication going on between different parts of the brain that handle our senses. It's like those brain areas are having a livelier conversation than usual. Like those friends who always interrupt each other because they know what the other's going to say. Uh, yeah, something like that. But instead of words, it's senses getting mixed up. Now, there's another theory. Hit me with it. This one's called disinhibited feedback. It suggests that it might not be about more connections, but about fewer filters. Fewer filters, huh? So less is more in this case. You could say that. Imagine your brain has checkpoints that usually control how much information flows between different senses. Right? Well, that makes sense. Well, in synesthesia, some of these checkpoints might be a bit more relaxed, allowing sensory information to flow more freely. Like a free-flowing river of senses. Exactly. It's like well, the brain is saying, hey, let's mix things up a bit and see what happens. Fascinating. You know, 
it's kind of humbling to think about how much we still don't know about the brain. It really is. But just knowing there are these different theories out there trying to explain synesthesia, it makes it all the more intriguing. For sure. And it gets even more interesting. Researchers think that what happens in our brains during early childhood, like when we're really young, could play a role too. Like our brains are still under construction. Exactly. Picture this. Your brain is forming connections like crazy when you're a kid. Makes sense. We learn so much at that age. Right. Well, some researchers believe that those connections are trimmed and organized differently in people with synesthesia. Connections that might usually fade away as we grow up might stick around. So it's like they hold on to these, what, extra pathways in the brain, and that leads to synesthesia. It's a possibility. It could be that these retained connections contribute to those unique sensory experiences. It's really a fascinating area of research. It really is. So to sum things up, synesthesia is this incredible mix of genetic predisposition, our brain's own unique wiring, and even a sprinkle of early childhood experiences. No wonder it's so complex. You got it. And that complexity is what makes it so captivating for researchers like me. I can imagine. So we've talked a lot about the science behind synesthesia, but what does it actually mean for people who experience it day to day. It's got to be more than just like a cool brain quirk, right? Absolutely. It's really interesting to think about how synesthesia might shape someone's life, you know, in practical ways. Right. Like imagine reading a menu and actually tasting the words. Right. Or remembering things without even trying. Exactly. It's like having a superpower memory. Speaking of superpowers, I remember reading in one of our sources, sin.txt, that it's like having a memory palace but on steroids. That's a great way to put it. So how does that work exactly? How would someone actually use synesthesia to remember stuff better? It's all about those unique connections. Let's say you need to remember a phone number. Someone with graphene color synesthesia might see each number as a different color, making the whole sequence way easier to remember. Like a rainbow phone number. So cool. <laughs> or picture this, studying for a history exam. All those dates and names could be linked to different tastes or even textures. That would definitely make studying more interesting. I'd ace history if I could taste the Boston Tea Party. Exactly. Those sensory associations would make it much easier to remember information. So it's not just people saying, oh, I think it helps me. There's actual research on this. Absolutely. Sin.txt actually highlights a bunch of studies showing that people with synesthesia often do better on memory tests than those without it, especially when it comes to remembering things they've seen or heard. Wow. Their brains are really wired for learning, huh? OK, but what about creativity? We've talked about artists and musicians with synesthesia like Farrell Williams, who sees music in color. He's a perfect example of how synesthesia can boost creativity. Farrell says his music is an explosion of color. A lot of people believe his unique sound comes from his synesthetic experiences. That's so cool. It's yeah. like he's translating those colors into music we can all enjoy. Exactly. And it's not just music either. Think about painters or sculptors who have synesthesia. They might see colors when they hear sounds or music. Wow. So that could influence their art. Definitely. It could affect everything. The colors they choose, the way they move their brush or chisel, the whole feeling they're going for. It's like their senses are working together to create something amazing. Synesthesia really shows us just how differently people experience the world. It's beautiful, actually. It really is. But it's important to remember that it's not always easy for people with synesthesia. It can also be pretty challenging. Right. It's not all rainbows and superpowers, is it? Unfortunately not. Synpindus.txt also talks about some of the downsides. Imagine being at a concert, right? Music's blasting, lights are flashing, everyone's singing along. For someone with synesthesia, especially if it's really intense, that could be totally overwhelming. I can see that. It'd be like all your senses are turned up to 100. Exactly. Now throw in a rush of colors, maybe even tastes, all triggered by the music in the crowd. Whoa. That sounds incredibly intense. It'd be like sensory overload times 1,000. It can be a lot to handle. Some people even say it makes them anxious. So what do people with synesthesia do to, like, cope with that? It depends on the person. Some people find that things like mindfulness or meditation help them manage all those sensations. Others need more control over their environment. Like turning down the lights or finding a quiet space. Exactly. It's all about finding what works for them to create some balance. Balance is key for sure. Definitely. And then there's the social aspect, which can be tough. 
Imagine trying to explain to someone that you can taste words or see colors when you listen to music. I bet that's really hard. Like trying to describe a dream. You were there, you experienced it, but you just can't quite put it into words for someone else. That's a great way to put it. It can be really isolating and make people feel like no one understands them. That's why it's so important to talk about synesthesia, right? To spread awareness and help people understand what it's really like. Absolutely. The more we talk about it, the more we can break down those barriers and create a more inclusive and understanding world for people with synesthesia. It's amazing to think about all the people throughout history who might have had synesthesia but didn't have a way to explain it. It really makes you wonder, doesn't it? Especially when you think about some of the great artists and innovators, like take Vincent van Gogh, for example. Oh, yeah, the Starry Night guy. That's the one. Some people believe he might have experienced chromesthesia. You mean he might have actually seen sounds as colors while he was painting? Imagine that. How much of his incredible, almost surreal art could be tied to synesthesia? We may never know for sure, but it's fascinating to consider. Totally. Looking at Starry Night with those swirling colors, it's like you're getting a glimpse into how his mind worked, you know? It really makes you appreciate the power of synesthesia, doesn't it? How it can shape not just our perceptions, but our creative expressions. And Van Gogh's not the only one. Sin.txt talks about Duke Ellington, the jazz legend. Oh, yeah. I remember reading about him. He's the one who said different musical notes had different colors for him, right? Exactly. He described music in a very visual way, almost like he was painting with sound. And when you listen to his music, you can hear that, all those layers and textures. It makes you wonder if his synesthesia played a part in how he composed those iconic pieces. It's like he was composing in color. That's so cool. And what about Tori Amos, right? She's another musician who experiences synesthesia, but differently again, right? Absolutely. She's talked about actually seeing her music, experiencing it as colors, textures, even shapes while she plays. It's like a whole other dimension of creativity. It's incredible how synesthesia can manifest in so many different ways. Each person's experience is totally unique. And it makes you realize that there's so much more to the human experience than we realize. Synesthesia really challenges our understanding of how the brain works. You know? It really does. So even if we don't have synesthesia ourselves, what can we learn from it? It's a reminder to pay attention to our own senses, to really appreciate the complexity of the world around us. Even if we don't taste words or see sounds, we can still cultivate a sense of awe and curiosity about how our brains make sense of it all. It's like a reminder that there's still so much we don't know about ourselves and the world around us. Exactly. And maybe, just maybe, there's a touch of synesthesia in all of us waiting to be discovered. That's a great point to end on. So as we wrap up our deep dive into synesthesia, it's clear that while we've learned a lot, there's still so much more to explore. Absolutely. The mysteries of the brain, the power of human perception. It's a journey of endless discovery. It really is. It really is.